Thank you for the clarification. I think we'll move on now you to Michael Harburg. So thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to apologize in advance. Um, I caught an allergy cough, and um, even my ENT boss says I probably should be on steroids. But what does she know? Um, I really want to, ex I hope that my comments uh, dovetail well in into uh, Dr. Sherman's comments, um, because I think they are two peas of the pod. Uh, we at Kaiser Permanente, we're a, a happy ecosystem of three elements. Um, the first element uh, is the health plan, which is the insurance company, hospitals that we own. Uh, in some cases, we don't. We'll talk about the implication of that in a second. As well as uh, the, the physical plants, pharmacy, radiology, um, of that like. The second critical is the Permanente Medical Groups, and these are large, multi-special medical groups. In fact, the three largest medical groups in the country are Northern Cal, Southern Cal, Mid-Atlantic Medical Groups of Permanente uh, that contract exclusively with the health plan to provide the medical services. And in fact, whether we own our hospitals or their partner hospitals, they are staffed, in fact, by Permanente Medical Group members. And I think that's also going to become issue one as we talk about some of the tensions involved. Sometimes there are elements that we have control over, whether it be internal care within Kaiser Permanente, a discussion of formularies, uh, devices, or uh, sometimes staff, versus when it's uh, inpatient and we don't own our hospitals. And that becomes a tension also of how we can generate and keep that evidence when we try to look at bigger picture and in fact, uh, there are some attempts now to solve that issue. I also think it's important that we talk about our mission. We are a very mission-driven organization. We're also very nonprofit. I can share that uh, I understand Dr. Sherman's views about nonprofit. We take it very seriously, sometimes evidently. Um, but we really do believe very firmly uh, in this concept of care and coverage. Uh, and the three legs of the organization, as envisioned by Dr. Sidney Garfield, who was our founder, is that of clinical care, education, both patient and provider, and also research. And in fact, our first research director in Kaiser Permanente was Maury Collin, who in 1960 called for uh, the electronic health record. And in fact, now the American Medical Informatics Association annual award is the Maury Collin Award, and I think that's very germane to what we're talking about today. Uh, we are large. We, are, uh, we care for over 3% of the US population. We are also West Coast, East Coast. I think that's important to note that the demographics of, of our patients, West Coast and East Coast, are very different. Uh, for example, most of my research and care is in HIV. I will tell you an East Coast our East Coast HIV uh, impacted members, uh, although uh, are a third female, 60% African American, and about a third heterosexual. On the West Coast, it is almost 80% white, with about another 15% Latino. They are almost all men who have sex with men. So it's a very different, sometimes demographics, and we, can, we will grapple with that in terms of as we interpret and use uh, clinical trials test results. I also want to point out that with over 21,000 physicians, we have to make some decisions at a higher level than leave it purely to the individual physician to decide. And you'll see in, in a couple slides the process that we go through, but I think it's important to point out that in a very large system, you have to have a certain amount of higher level organization that you hope, though, really reflects the views of the bottom up and not just the top down. And obviously, we deliver a lot of care. So what do we need to know when we make a decision? Um, I'm going to go down the left side. First off, you know, and I know everyone in this room knows that there is a difference between efficacy and effectiveness. And maybe these last couple questions that came in the discussion were, in fact, very germane. Um, we do know that a clinical trial is often an idealized version of what we would all hope the care would be. Having said that, in the real world, that often is not exactly how the care is delivered. 
or what the patients are doing in advance. <coughs> For example, if they're required to take a medicine daily, often in a clinical trial there will be multiple efforts at reminders, including not the least of which are MEMS caps. MEMS caps, in fact, a wonderful way that for patients to, uh, to tell, for a doctor to tell if a patient is taking their meds as prescribed, in fact, are quite expensive. And sometimes they're more expensive than the prescription. So as a result, um, it may not be an effective way, per se, to, uh, to monitor. Um, who did the studies? This, for us, is a very critical question. And there are hierarchies to it. <coughs> and I'm going to tell you, we, we usually do put a hierarchy of NIH federal studies, especially in oncology. You could talk about NCI collaborative trials, foundation grants, and we'll talk about that in one second, versus industry. <coughs> or was the research done within KP? We tend to believe our own data much sooner than we believe other people's outside data. I would also add that we also have many partners with which we do research with, not the least of which is Harvard Pilgrim, through, uh, whether it be through Sentinel, PCORnet, or the Healthcare Systems Research Network, HCSRN. And because these are systems that we've agreed to data collection and data interpretation and data processing, and in fact, sometimes the systems, especially within the HCSRN, are healthcare systems akin to ours, it is easier to take that data and to, uh, to interpret and believe it more closely. Now, also, for us, as we make a decision, what is our population at risk? Does the data reflect our population? And as I just noted previously, you have to make sure that it does it, in fact, does it reflect all of our patient population? Or does it reflect just one slice of our patient population? I will give a lot of examples from HIV. In HIV, a lot of data is often does not include a lot of women. So sometimes that will limit our generalizability <coughs> excuse me, of the data. No, I got here. Further, um, further, it may very well be that it was all white MSM and, again, doesn't reflect the, the population out here. And some of that's biologic differences, some of that's social and economic differences. And all those have to be considered. And then we always see, can we generate our own data to answer the question? So sometimes, uh, also especially in phase four, we can generate our own data. Uh, we were a significant part of Merck uh, with phase four drugs for their first uh, for their first integrase inhibitor in HIV. And for many other drugs, we're very much involved in phase four trials, whether it be one KP region or collaboratively as multiple. Then we always ask, what do we do presently? Is, what we're to, is the innovation an improvement? Um, there are a lot of innovations that sound innovative, but really aren't really a step forward. And that has to be asked with a critical eye. Of course, what is the added cost? And I think Dr. Sherman expressed that really well. And then finally, how do you operationalize such a change? So this last two years, we have put in place in Kaiser Mid-Atlantic two innovations. One, to increase the number of patients with hepatitis C diagnosed stage and then got the care that was needed to be delivered, understanding the cost, as well as taking care of patients with sickle cell crisis out of the uh, ERs and into our clinical decision units. Both of those took uh, over a year to affect those changes. Operationalizing change is hard work. So how do we gather the data? <coughs> well, big data is our data. Uh, I don't want to get into the number of, uh, I forget what's above, pteridites, pegadites, and pick your dites. Um, Bites, but big data. But I will tell you, we can swim in data and we can drown in data. And it's curating the quality of the data, including use of natural language processing, which I think is going to be, was mentioned earlier, I think is going to be critical if we want to really include the patient experience in our data. But those methodologies are far from fully realized. Our own research units. Uh, Greg Simon and myself each come from two of our research units uh, in Kaiser Permanente. We put a lot of faith in our research units because they're using our data and they're using statistical methodologies that we are quite comfortable interpreting. We also do internal uh, guideline panels. 
I'm in charge of the H, for example, the HIV and STD pan, uh, guidelines within Kaiser Permanente. We cull data from outside the system and within our own. Certainly systematic reviews can be done internally. We have units to do that, but we also use a lot of external uh, uh, systematic reviews, including from what could be viewed as some of our competitors, think the blues, uh, and certainly cheap groups. And also, let's not forget financial planning. If we were to take a thing like adopting, making sure that all our patients had hepatitis C care, and trust me, I, Dr. Sherman's, uh, Michael's uh, estimation of the cost, of the inordinate cost of it, how do you do that? Because if you're deciding to treat something, at some point you're doing that at the expense of something else. So points of tension. I think I've already mentioned most of these, but I think it's worth mentioning again. Again, it's important to note we are mission dri driven. Truly the goal is to do the right thing at the first, the first time. Sometimes that is the more expensive <coughs> test, device, medication, but if in the long run that saves lives and in fact uh, improves the patient experience, it is worthwhile. However, that's an investment often beyond the calendar year and sometimes for some of the, the number crunchers and certainly for some of the actuaries, that is a hard concept. But it is truly also no money, no mission. Prevention first if possible. I think it's great to develop all these new drugs, but if we can prevent uh, a, a disease from happening, the cost savings can often be immense. Uh, it's better if patients don't smoke than, than to develop the treatment of COPD and lung cancer. It's better if patients who are sexually active uh, to use HIV prevention prophylaxis versus uh, having to treat HIV infections eventually. And for that matter, uh, safer sex to prevent other STDs. We're in the middle, by the way, if you didn't know, of a gonorrhea or syphilis epidemic. Not to change the subject. Is the tr newer treatment better than previous? You know, generics for hypertension, I gotta tell you, lisinopril, hydrochlorothiazide, and atenolol do really work damn well. Um, the issue is often not getting the evidence. The issue is believing the evidence presented. And again, is it really unbiased? What level over, over prior therapy? Who did the study? Who does that da data reflect? And I do say always, we do believe our own data before others. And where are the gaps in the data? And this is very critical because if there are significant gaps in the data, especially in terms of populations, that makes us more reluctant to to be part of it. And then, as much as I love to put emphasis on data, evidence-based medicine, randomized clinical trials, we all know culture eats, eats evidence for lunch as an appetizer. And the fact of the matter is, anecdote still rules the day, both among physicians and patients. You know, if it's one patient, it was in my experience. If it's two, it's in my series. And if it's three, it's case after case after case. And it's important to keep it in mind. So how do we decide? Well, it may be based on new knowledge in the literature, pharmacy or a physician request to review the literature, patient demand, that is not a small point anymore. Patient activists are now more than just act up. And it's important to understand their needs and certainly, as we've talked about earlier, sometimes their hopes. Um, I think it's also important, our, again, our KP experience is important. And then sometimes state or federal statutes will dictate what we need to do. We do go to, we do send this, as I said, we're a hierarchy. We do need to, with 21,000 physicians, have to go to the appropriate regional and interregional committees to decide. Formulary committees, our interregional new technologies committees, chiefs groups, guideline committees, and special ad hoc groups. They all are interregional. They help us make a decision based both on KP data, outside data, data. But I do want to differentiate between a committee recommendation, a benefits decision, and a formulary decision. And we can see this in HIV all the time. Uh, the HIV committee will recommend that a drug be added to the formulary. It may even be approved for the formulary. Or maybe it's not a, uh, it's not a drug, but it's something like Sculptra, uh, facial filler for the patients for iatrogenic 
uh, lipo, uh, lipoatrophy. It may be recommended by the committee as a good treatment. It may even be permitted on the formulary, but it may not be a covered benefit. So those are always three separate decisions to make. The groups talk to each other, but they're not uh, necessarily conjoined. And finally, um, I do think our aim is always collaboration and really getting what's best for the patient. So thank you. Any, any clarifying questions for Dr. Horbrug? <coughs> Terrific. Uh, Dr. Ford? 